When disaster strikes, government agencies typically rush in to help politicians pledging taxpayer money to make things right quickly so that lives and business can get back to normal. But whether it's the destruction of a key bridge or a train derailment that upends a tiny Ohio town, vows of help may be no guarantee that everything and everyone will be made right. Scott Thuman reports. Hold all traffic on the key bridge. Uh, there's a ship approaching that just lost their steering. With just seconds to spare, police stopped drivers from trying to cross the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. As a giant cargo ship that lost power topples the vital passageway, killing six workers on the bridge and effectively closing one of the busiest ports on the East Coast. Within hours, local, state and federal agencies arrive on scene. And as daylight reveals the scope of the damage and what it will take to rebuild and reopen, the president instantly promising $60 million just to start. It's my intention that federal government will pay for the entire cost of reconstructing that bridge. A much different response than one seen at another infrastructure disaster last year, when 38 cars of a Norfolk Southern freight train derailed in the tiny town of East Palestine, Ohio. 11 tank cars ignited, 2,000 residents were evacuated. Rescue workers and state and federal government teams rushed to help. Two days later, amid concern that the remaining tank cars could overheat and explode, the local fire chief made the call to release and burn toxic vinyl chloride. We recently returned to East Palestine to see how the town has recovered from its toxic transportation disaster. Misty Allison and her family left their home before the controlled chemical burn, but returned soon after feeling relatively safe. I can vividly remember seeing a news article a couple of days after we came home, and the article said something along the lines of, new chemicals were found on the train, and we were told that it was safe to come home, that the air was fine, the water was fine, the soil was fine, everything was fine, and that we were allowed to come home. Chrissy Ferguson grew up in this house near the center of town, but when she visits her old home these days, it's just to collect the mail. She now lives 10 miles away in Columbiana. She recently injured her neck in an auto accident. We have the contaminated creek run underneath our home and the water comes in daily through a floor drain. We still are not back in our home. There's six in my family. I'll never feel safe in this home again. I, in my opinion, it cannot be cleaned. After the disaster, a parade of political leaders and officials <laughs> and the governor trying to reassure about water quality. Three weeks after the derailment, former President Trump came too. We have told you loud and clear you are not forgotten. President Biden didn't visit till a year later and declined to make a disaster declaration for the town. We will rebuild together. And while his transportation secretary, Pete Buttigieg, was at the Baltimore Bridge collapse within hours, it took nearly three weeks for him to visit East Palestine. We're going to be here day in, day out, year in, year out. Ohio's two senators, one from each party, took the lead in putting maximum pressure on the government and the railroad company. The company followed the Wall Street business model, boost profits by cutting costs at all costs. The consequences for places like East Palestine be damned. Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw visited the town several times and promised to pay for the cleanup and for residents' costs. So far, the company says it has spent more than a billion dollars on the cleanup most of that to deal with contamination. Our videos from then and now show big changes, but on the town's outskirts, crews are still hard at work. The scene behind me here, drastically different than it was just a year ago. They've since removed about 176,000 tons of contaminated soil. That's about 350 million pounds, a tremendous amount, and they say there's still a lot of work to be done. When we first met Carrie Lentz, she and her family were living in a hotel 
well away from East Palestine. We can hear the trains right now. Correct. Yep, so we're <laughs> perfect timing. We're less they returned to their home the several winery. months ago. It feels good to be back. It feels very good to be back and refreshing. It's nice to see the neighbors. It's In nice terms of her family's health, Lenz says she's most concerned about her son, who's developed asthma. She monitors the interior air quality 24-7. So green is good. One of the things that we talked about last time was you said you didn't really know if you could trust everything you were being told back then. Yes. Do you still feel that way? It's hard. There's conflicting information. Um, there's still neighbors that aren't home and that have said that their homes are testing, testing back, you know, contaminated. Do we fully trust what they've been telling us? The railroad, they've been, they've, they're here. They didn't, they didn't turn their backs on us. They've been doing the work. EPA has been here, they haven't left us. But just something like in the back of my mind, it's just like, can it really truly be good in what they say? That idea of not being able to trust what you're being told is something we heard more than once in East Palestine. And recently, the biggest decision made at the time of the disaster has been called into question. In March, the head of the National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB, said it turns out doing a controlled burn of chemicals wasn't needed because the tank cars were not getting dangerously hot, as had been thought. Over the course of 22 hours, that uh, tank car was cooling, not to mention the other four tank cars that were only between 64 and 69 degrees. When you heard that, what'd you think? It's absolutely infuriating because if you look back at everything that's happened, I think the cleanup would be done if the five tankers of vinyl chloride were not engulfed in flames. The response here raises questions about how officials deal with transportation disasters that happen regularly. On the rails, there have been several incidents since East Palestine, including one in Alabama and another in Pennsylvania, both involving Norfolk Southern. A derailment in Colorado involved BNSF, a different company, and one man died. At the federal level, a new rail safety act was introduced after the East Palestine accident. It has bipartisan support, but Congress has yet to pass it. Has this experience left you more or less confident in your government? Probably a little bit less. I mean, I feel bad saying that, but because there are just big mistakes made. I wish it would have been handled better, so I have a little less confidence and their ability to handle those situations. And for those who experienced the worst symptoms or who still can't come home, this disaster isn't over. No one deserves this. There are children that have nosebleeds daily. There's seizures. There's cancers that are already here. Can you 100% say that it's from the derailment? They know that you can't. Do people feel it is in their hearts? Yeah. President Biden promised to have taxpayers pay the full cost of repairing this bridge or rebuilding it. Almost immediately, did he do the same thing in East Palestine? Uh, no, he didn't. And so far, the federal government has not said how much taxpayer money has been spent. The majority of it has been by the rail company, Norfolk Southern, more than a billion dollars so far. So how much will this pledge to rebuild that bridge cost taxpayers? The bridge itself could be anywhere between 400 and $800 million, although insurance will likely pay for a lot of that. The real cost is going to be lost wages and business from the port. That's what taxpayers are going to be on the hook for. All right, Scott, thanks.